I'm going to start chapter summaries. This is the chapter summary for chapter two, Forces. And just so you know, I am using this textbook. This is uh, the fifth edition, sorry about that, uh, College Physics, John Batista, uh, not for resale. And so I'm gonna go over the main ideas in, this, in the master, the concepts. Now, just as a reminder, you still have to read the book, okay? And you still have to work problems. And, you know, this is just a kind of like a, a summary to get you started. And I'm not going to do chapter one because I kind of already did a video on that. And it's all about units, scientific notation, stuff like that, which I don't, they're kind of, I mean, I don't know. I guess it's okay. So also this book has some things in a slightly different order. Um, a lot of times textbooks will start off with, uh, kinematics, velocity, position, acceleration, and then go into forces. And this one starts off with forces first. So let's, and there is one thing, the most important thing in here uh, is vectors. And that's the first thing. Why? Why is vectors important? Because force is a vector. So what is a vector? And, and I know I'm not going to give my full vector lecture, Okay, I'm going to give you the summary, just as a reminder. So there's actually two kinds of things. There's a scalar, and then there's a vector. So a scalar would be things like mass, time, <clears throat> time, um, energy is one. We're not going to see that later. One more, let's get one more. One more scalar value. Uh, charge, no. Nah, that's fine. And then vectors are things like force, we put an arrow over it, velocity, we put an arrow over it, position, we put an arrow over it. And so essentially a vector is a variable with more than one piece of information and these just have one. So sometimes people say, oh, it has a magnitude and direction. And I don't really like that definition, but I'm gonna write it down because it was in that movie, uh, Despicable Me. And I like that movie. So that is true. It does have magnitude and direction, but it's actually more than that. It's better than that. I like to say it's more than one piece of information. And so we uh, denote this arrow over it so we can we don't confuse it between those things. So you could represent a vector as an arrow like this. So let's call this the force arrow. And so it does have a magnitude and direction. In two dimensions, it actually can be a three-dimensional vector. Um, but that's one way we can represent that. And so in this case, the length of the vector matters, the direction of the vector matters, but really we could call this, uh, if we call this my X and Y direction, I can represent this as two pieces of information. I'll call this FX and I'll call this FY. So this says, I can represent this as uh, how much is it in the x direction? That's one piece of information. How much is it in the y direction? That's two pieces of information. And then you could do z also. Um, so just just as a, and, and this is a right triangle because x and y are, are perpendicular. So whatever that angle is right there, we have a right triangle and that's kind of nice. So if you know that right triangle, I can say the magnitude fx is equal to the magnitude of f times the cosine of theta the magnitude of Fy is equal to the magnitude of F times the sine of theta. And so we call, uh, if I write this without the arrow, it, we mean the magnitude. So you could say F is equal to the magnitude of F. We also write it like that, which is going to be the square root of Fx squared plus Fy squared. I'm going to go ahead and add plus Fz squared. We won't do too much two-dimensional, three-dimensional vectors, but it is, it is there. Um, so we can, and that's just from the Pythagorean theorem, right? If I want to find the length of that side. But the most important thing, and be careful, these are only true if theta is measured from the x-axis. So you always want to look at your triangle to get these relationships between the components and the force. Um, but the most important thing is how do you add vectors? If I have two vectors, vector A plus vector B, uh, I can add that and call that vector C then CX is going to be AX plus BX. Yeah. The X component of C is the sum of these X components. The Y component 
of C is the, y, the sum of the Y components, and my Ys are not really good. And then the Z component is equal to the sum of the Z components. And that's why we want to always find these components because we can add them uh, as components, and that makes it much easier. And again, there's a whole bunch of stuff in vectors. Um, there's multiplying by a scalar. There's, um, you know, uh, other operations, but we won't get into that too much. Really, this is what you need to know. Why do you need to know that? Because force is a vector. Uh, and one thing that we're going to deal with a lot is called the net force, F net. It's just the sum of all the forces. So this would be F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus however many forces you have. And that's the net force. Um, and why would you do that? Well, it turns out that we're going to deal with situations where the net force is zero. Um, but And these are vectors, right? So you could actually write this as two equations in two dimensions. I could say F net X is going to be F1 X plus F2 X plus F3 X and so forth. And then I could do the same thing for the Y. F net Y is F1 Y plus F2 Y and so forth. One more thing, and this is in there too, the unit of force, uh, the magnitude of force is going to be in units of a Newton, which is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. Okay, I'm just looking over here. Uh, Newton's first law, let's talk about that. And because this, this chapter, actually, I'm going to go over both of these. Uh, Newton's first law is not really that big of a deal. This says that, um, I'm going to write it the way I think is the best. Natural state, because that's what it really means. The natural state of an object is constant velocity. So that means that what do forces do? Forces change the motion of an object. Um, and you know you can say, oh, an object will remain at rest or remain moving in a straight line unless acted on by a force. That's the way it's commonly stated in the books. But this is there because of Aristotle. So and I'll, let me just say this really quick. Uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, Stotol, as I spell it right, uh, said that if you leave an object alone, it will stop. So he said, natural state is at rest. And it's kind of a big idea because we, we often fall into this Aristotle idea because he was really made a lot of sense. And so a lot of times you may catch yourself thinking, oh, well, if there's no forces on it, it's going to stop. If it's moving, there has to be a force on it. And that's actually wrong. Let's, let's go ahead and put a big X through that because that does not agree with experimental evidence. Newton's first law is really just saying, no, Aristotle was wrong. Because you could say this is repeated with the second law, which we're not going to do in this chapter. Uh, we will do that in the next chapter. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you Newton's third law. I don't really care if you memorize which one's first, which one's second, and third, and so forth. It doesn't really matter to me. But And I'm going to write this the best way that I like it, too. This is going to be forces uh, come in pairs. And again, often you will see this as uh, the equal and opposite. Uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I don't like action and reaction. I'm going to write that down action and reaction and I'm going to cross it out. I don't like that because it implies that that there has to be some type of change in motion. Action implies things that move. Um, but really what this says is that if I have two objects and let's call this object A and let's call this object B and they're interacting in some way. It could be a gravitational interaction. It could be uh, a collision, it doesn't really matter. Then I have two forces, the force that A exerts on B and then the force that B exerts on A. 
and I'm gonna put the arrows right there. And we don't normally put these. And this says that the magnitude of this is equal to the magnitude of that. So F B on A is equal, and the directions are opposite, so I can actually write it like this. F A, I was gonna write it two ways, but I decided not to. That's Newton's third law. Forces come in pairs. There's always an interaction between two objects, always an interaction between two objects. And so if A pushes on B, B pushes on A with the same magnitude, but in opposite direction. I mean, where do you have this with distances, right? So here's, here's my United States. That's not that great. Uh, and let's say New York's right there and LA is right there. And then I have uh, this distance this is New York to LA. It's a direction and it has a distance. And then I have this. I have LA to New York. Which one's greater? Well, they're the same distance in opposite directions. Now, it may take you longer one way or the other, but it's the same distance in opposite directions. And in fact, distances come in pairs too. It's always the distance between these two places. It's a force between those two. Same thing. Okay, you couldn't have one of these different distance than the other. Got it. Okay, moving on. Free body diagrams. Body, not Bonnie body diagrams. So we, when we want to look at the total forces acting on an object, we're going to draw that object as a point, and then we're going to draw all the forces acting on it as vectors. F1, uh, F2, F3. And, you know, one of the things here you'll notice is that I'm just calling this force 1, 2, and 3. Um, but they're due to some other objects, and that's an important thing. You, you want to be very careful not to put a force that this pushes on something else. So the common example is if I have uh, block A right here and block B sitting on top of it, uh, then I can, for B, I can put this, the gravitational force, I'll call it FG, and then I'll put right here FA on B. Okay, I don't want to put the force that B pushes on A on the B diagram. This is for B. Okay, so be very careful about that. Don't make that mistake. Uh, it, it is a common mistake. Um, free body diagrams. Yeah. So you want to, now one of the other thing about free body diagrams, uh, we want to include two, there are two types of forces. There are contact forces, and then there's long range. And probably the only long range force we're going to deal with is the gravitational force. It's long range because it can exert a force. This is actually a force uh, exerted on it due to the Earth, and they're not touching. It doesn't have to be touching. It's a long range force. The other forces that we look at are contact forces, so it's always something touching that. Now, contact forces, we can debate whether they're actually contacting or not, and I don't really mind. Uh, but that's one way to break it up. If it's not touching it, and it's not a long-range force, then it shouldn't be there. And that's an important thing, because a lot of people will put, like, a ball's moving. Well, there's the force of the throw. What's the object and what's touching? And there is no force of the throw. So just be careful about that. Okay, they have the, next they have the gravitational force. Uh, I'm going to write it, and then we're gonna, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to write it how they write it, G M1 M2 over R squared, where G is a constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. Uh, M1 and M2 are two objects, and R is the distance between their centers. So if I have an object here and an object here, M1, M2, R. And so you can calculate the magnitude of the gravitational force between two objects. Um, it's, it's a, it's, can be complicated, um, because this is actually a vector, but, uh, if you want to do this as a vector, then you have to deal with R as a vector and, and the book doesn't want to do that. I mean, I'll probably show you how to do that later, but that's, uh, that. If you put the earth as one of the objects with the radius of the Earth and a person standing on the surface of the Earth. So if M1 
is the mass of the Earth, and r is the radius of the Earth. No, r is the radius of the Earth. Then g mass of the Earth over r squared is equal to 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And so we can actually write the weight, the magnitude of the weight, as just m g, and we'll call that little g. That's the local gravitational constant or the gravitational field. So we already have two forces. Um, next we have, I'm running out of paper. The next force that we want to look at is the normal force. So normal here means perpendicular. I'm not going to write it because I'll spell it wrong, so I'll put perpendicular. That's what that means. This is a force between two surfaces that's perpendicular to the surface. So if I have, uh, it's a contact force. It's actually a force of constraint, um, and that's an important thing too. Let me put that down here. We have constraint forces and calculated forces. So for, normal force is a force of constraint in that it applies whatever magnitude it needs to keep this block on that table. Okay, so it would be perpendicular. I'm going to call this, what does the book call it? Fn or n? It just calls it n. But it is a vector and it is perpendicular to the surface. Okay, but there's no equation for it because it's like whatever it needs to do to keep that block on the surface. If you have a tilted surface like this, this is one a problem that a lot of people make mistakes. If I have it like that, the normal force is this way, right? Which is perpendicular to the surface. So it does not have to be up and it does not have to be equal to the weight, the gravitational force. The next force is the frictional force. There's actually two types. Again, this is mostly a constraint force. Um, this is the force that's parallel to surface and opposes the motion. I think I might spell that wrong. So we can calculate this. Uh, if, if it's not sliding, we call this, I'm going to use the same thing. They, they use Fs less than or equal to mu s times n. So this is the coefficient of static friction. I'll have to put static. And it's a coefficient that depends on the two types of materials that are interacting. Is it wood and steel, uh, rubber and asphalt, whatever. It's a coefficient. And then n is the normal force. So if you push these two surfaces to harder together, it increases the friction force. Now, this less than or equal to, if I push on a block and it doesn't move, well, I can't have, if I have a greater frictional force pushing back, then it, it, would, it would move backwards and it doesn't do that. Um, so it's, this is the maximum value. Once you exceed that, you get into kinetic friction, and it's equal to mu k times n, and this is kinetic. It's just a different coefficient, um, but, and it's equal to, so that's when the two materials are sliding relative to each other. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, tension. So we use T for this. And tension is, if you have a, something like this, here's a, something swinging, I can have a tension T. The one nice thing about tensions is that they always pull, and they always pull in the direction of the rope. And we're gonna deal with massless ropes uh, just to make things easier, but that's that. So that, that it's really, to summarize chapter two, it's some of the forces, net force, and what are forces. And how do we add forces? We deal with them as vectors. So we have uh, the gravitational force, the gravitational force on the surface of the Earth, the normal force, tension force, friction force. And that's that. Okay.